Oh, citizens, what a pleasure. Welcome back to El Monticello. And particularly welcome here to, uh, well, the North, uh, the North Terrace and uh, our carriage bays here and one or two horse stalls. Uh, I'm delighted that we can all convene uh, for a time this afternoon upon the subject of horses and carriages, uh, one of my favorite subjects. And we're happy as well to have Ms. Alice Wagner uh, back with us to moderate uh, your questions. So if you would allow, I'd be happy to engage uh, your curiosities and your questions. However, again, if you would allow, uh, I may remove my mask to be heard more clearly and distinctly. Thank you. There we are. That's better. Well, Ms. Wagner, what is the first question from our friends today? Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Growing up in Virginia in the mid-18th century, what were your early experiences with horses? Oh, my. <laughs> I doubt you could be born and brought up with, in Virginia without a love of horses. It is natural, as is the cultivation of the soil. It always has been for me. Uh, I grew up amongst horses, not only those that my father owned, uh, those that came to us uh, through my mother's family and my grandparents. I would reckon that the the very first experience I recall with horses was when I was two years of age. That would have been 17 and 45. My mother's cousin, Mr. William Randolph of Tuckahoe Plantation near Richmond had passed away, leaving his family there with the necessity of a guardian. And my father was one of the executors of his will. And so it was my father removed our family from Shadwell Plantation where I was born uh, to ride out to Tuckahoe Plantation. And my earliest memory, two years of age, was being placed on a velvet cushion and handed up, if you will, to, to an individual on horseback. And there, that person held me in their lap as the horse made its way from Shadwell, a two-day ride up to Tuckahoe Plantation. I remember some of my earliest uh, horses that I enjoyed to ride. Alec Croker, oh, what a pleasure. And Young Fear Not and Caractacus. <laughs> the next question. How many horses do you own at any given time? Oh, mercy. How many horses at any given time? Well, when you consider that I have a good five plantations here spread out over 5,000 acres and Every plantation has their own stable, and to think that stable therein are draft horses, that is, work horses, let alone mules. Uh, and then, of course, here at Monticello, I always try to have at least four horses for carriages and a good riding horse, at least one riding horse. I would venture to say that at any one time over all of the farms, so maybe 15, 16, 17, and when you think throughout my entire life, as I begin to reflect upon them, uh, referring to Alley Croker, of course, and Old Fear Not, Young Fear Not, Caractacus, Tarquin, uh, Bramo, uh, Polly Peachum, Romulus, and Remus. I would say that uh, it's been upwards of, oh, maybe 20 horses throughout my life thus far. Oh, and of course, Eagle, the Eagle, he is my favorite riding horse at present. Your next question. Do you have a favorite breed of horses, and do you breed horses? Well, when I was a young man, yes, I, I delighted in breeding horses. I was very much interested in it. I would say from the time that uh, I inherited my father's estate, maybe even before that, because he passed away in 57. I was only 14 years of age, but by that time, I was most accomplished on horseback. Uh, I was very interested in the, the breeding of horses. You might call it high-bred horses. Uh, to follow the particular bloodlines of, well, simply the best English racing horses. Uh, I heard someone use the name thoroughbred the other day, and I, I would reckon that's an applicable uh, term. But um, no, I would say my favorite horse remains uh, a, good, uh, a good racing horse, though I do not believe in racing. I've never engaged in that. That's a pastime for which I do not care. But then, of course, uh, that has created a breed here in Virginia we refer to as the quarter horse. And yes, they are a swift horse, a very fine horse. Uh, they're about uh, 16 hands with respect to about um, 
oh, 64 inches high. That's about five feet, four inches from ground to withers. And uh, usually bays. Oh, I love bays. Uh, Caractacus was a bay. A beautiful bay horse. He had, uh, well, he had white ankles behind, and he had a little white spot <laughs> on his face. <laughs> Your next question. One of our viewers, Deborah, wants to know if there are certain breeds of her horses that are preferred for specialized tasks such as riding or plowing. Well, a good draft horse, as I referred to earlier, is, uh, is specifically a, a working horse. Uh, yes, you can ride them, but I, I prefer a, a fine hybrid, as I mentioned earlier, for a riding horse. I, I keep four horses for carriages. I think I mentioned that. Uh, I would not like to use one of the carriage horses for riding. I prefer one horse, a separate, a fifth horse, if you will, when I travel uh, specifically for riding. Uh, that would be the eagle uh, specifically for riding. I have referred often to Caractacus. Oh, I enjoyed Caractacus as a, a riding horse to and from uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, when I was a young man. Earlier than that, I had mentioned Ellie Croker. Yes, uh, she was a very fine riding horse. By the way, these names, I hope, have been beguiling to you all because they are one of the favorite elements of, uh, of breeding horses, providing names for them. Uh, I hope you do not forget who Caractacus was. I think it's an appropriate name for a valiant horse. Caractacus was a, a British chieftain. Uh, that is, many, many centuries ago, I would reckon about uh, the first century A.D., uh, he was well known for rallying all of the British tribes together to, to do battle against the ancient Romans trying to conquer uh, the British Isles. He was even captured by the ancient Romans and brought back to Rome where I believe he lived the rest of his life. But he was famous for rallying all of the British tribes uh, into battle, carrying his shield, carrying his sword without a stitch of clothing. Does a fine horse wear clothes? No, but what a fine name for a, a very elegant and well-bred riding horse. Your next question. Another guest would like to know where you get your horses. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I initially endeavored breeding horses. Uh, and that was from the late 1750s, right up until about the time uh, of our war, of the American Revolution. Now, since that time, uh, then I have purchased horses. I have purchased a very fine horse from my son-in-law, uh, Mr. Epps. Uh, I purchased horses from various individuals uh, in our neighborhood. Um, I mentioned early on uh, some of the horses that I owned as, as a young man. Uh, they were bought uh, from my friends. Uh, Mr. Frank Willis was one who sold me a horse when I was, was younger. So now that I've grown older, yes, I want to, to purchase horses more than I, I have continued to breed them. Your next question. Tell us something about your habits and preferences in using horses for transportation. Do you prefer to ride or use a carriage? And what type of carriages do you own? Well, I can tell you I'm never a day out of the saddle. That's my most pleasant exercise. And oftentimes, even when I am in great distress, such as when Mrs. Jefferson passed away, it was on horseback that I found the greatest solace. I remember my daughter, not yet married, but Martha would accompany me. Uh, there are the many days I would, well, ultimately simply get lost in the woods and the forest. Oftentimes Martha could not even find me, but there you have my great interest in horseback riding. I provide uh, several hours a day for a good ride about all of my farms, uh, not only in supervising, but simply for the exercise. Uh, many have considered me a hard rider. Yes, I do enjoy riding swift in the saddle. But I'm not going to say that uh, I prefer horseback riding over long distances. No, a uh, horseback ride is good to ride down simply to Shadwell or to my mills at Mitten, Milton or, or to Charlottesville. Um, and then sometimes I might even ride more, uh, more of a distance uh, up to visit my friend Mr. Madison at Montpelier. However, for long rides, well, then I prefer a carriage. I have several carriages, and my favorite that I ride uh, more than any other, uh, which I usually ride in a drive alone, uh, is a, a phaeton. Uh, there, here's an example of my uh, two-seated phaeton. 
Uh, I enjoy uh, taking my grandchildren to bed in the Phaeton. Uh, in fact, when Mrs. Smith, Margaret Bayard Smith, came to visit us here at uh, Monticello, I was so happy to show her around all of the farms that I took my granddaughter Ellen and Mrs. Smith in our Phaeton here uh, and drove at a great speed amongst all of the, the roads here about the mountain. She got a bit worried. I reassured her it'll be fine, but at a particular point uh, she decided no more and she <laughs> alighted from the Phaeton uh, and would not get back in unless I was uh, the more comforting for her in, in driving. I usually drive myself. Uh, I prefer the Phaeton perhaps to be uh, pulled by one horse. I'll all, often take two, yes. And then I prefer either Burl Cobert uh, to ride alongside me. Uh, he accompanied me uh, to Washington City on occasion and back. Um, Mr. David Hearn the Younger, David Hearn, uh, also accompanied me and drove the Phaeton accordingly to and from Washington City. Uh, when I was much younger, well, then Jupiter, Jupiter Evans, uh, the two of us having grown up together, uh, Jupiter uh, would drive uh, either my Phaeton or he'd ride horseback alongside me. And that continued for many years. Good heavens, do you know Jupiter accompanied me up to Washington City? Uh, in 1800, when we were removing our government from Philadelphia to be there that autumn of 1800, and sadly, most sadly indeed, that was when Jupiter took ill. And though uh, attended to by a doctor in, uh, in Fredericksburg, lamentably, he passed away. It was after that that Wormley Hughes then uh, drove on occasion. Uh, David Hearn, as I mentioned, and now Burl Colbert uh, will either drive or, or ride horseback next to me. The next question. You mentioned some of the different women in your family, like Mrs. Jefferson and Mrs. Randolph. Uh, how often would they ride, and did they have to use a special saddle for it? <laughs> yes, I make certain that uh, the ladies in uh, our family uh, learn how to ride at a young age, and Mrs. Jefferson was indeed accomplished. Um, my daughters aforementioned uh, Martha, uh, Mrs. Randolph, and the late Mrs. Epps, uh, my daughter Polly. They were both accomplished in the saddle, and I try to encourage my granddaughters to ride as well. Now, they are able to ride uh, this particular saddle, yes, though at times that's rather ungracious uh, for a young girl and a young lady, so I encourage them to ride side saddle. Uh, that is quite a painting for a young lady to be seated so uh, on horseback. Uh, so, um, as I continue to realize, young, young ladies uh, feel as happy and accomplished in the saddle as any young man. Uh, I think we should continue to encourage uh, horseback to our young, both male and female alike. Your next question. How long would it take you to ride to places like Philadelphia or Richmond? Well. When you consider I live in a four mile an hour world, even so, still I know of no place upon the globe where you can travel any faster than a ship at sea or a horse on land. Uh, you consider that I'm able to travel about 35, 40 miles a day, that's a comfortable distance. So um, when young, traveling to Williamsburg, Virginia to attend the Old World College of William and Mary, uh, to read law with Mr. With, to practice law, that 120 miles has never taken me less than five days in the saddle. Now, when I would travel up to Philadelphia, it was usually from Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, and oftentimes, I would simply, uh, well, venture out to ship, uh, docked uh, or more or less uh, harbored in, on the York River at Yorktown, and then ship would sail out the York River to the Chesapeake, up the Chesapeake, usually to Chestertown in Maryland, and then that's where I would light and alight and head up farther uh, to Philadelphia. Now Washington, and that was usually from Williamsburg, seven to nine days, uh, all depending. And I would reckon as well from Monticello up to Philadelphia, as I, I rode up there March uh, of 1776. Well, actually, no, my mother passed away the end of March the 31st. How could I forget it? I was planning to leave, but her death was unexpected. So uh, I remained here at Monticello almost succumbing to a migraine headache that accompanied me for two weeks, but then set out, uh, if you will, uh, in April. 
and that was a good seven to nine day uh, ride, as I, I recall it at that time. Washington City, that's uh, between three and, and four days uh, in the saddle or in my phaeton, uh, all depending. Uh, when I'd leave Monticello, I head up to Gordonsville, very fine tavern there, uh, from Gordonsville up to Orange, uh, and then from Orange to Stevensburg, and then from there, uh, I head to, to Fredericksburg in, in Washington City. We have a question from another guest. Petite would like to know, who cared for the horses, especially when they were sick? Oh, and they are often sick, lamentably so, and we must attend and care for them. Uh, our horses are looked after by those of great expertise, I like to say, uh, here at Monticello and at my other farms. But at Monticello, well, I mentioned earlier, uh, Jupiter was attendant, and then later, of course, Wormley Hughes, who also attends to our, our gardens. Uh, Wormley and Jupiter, Israel, Gillette, uh, often used as a postillion. Uh, with my new Landale, I want to uh, drive a good uh, four horses, and, and Israel rides postillion upon them. But he, and along with Wormley Hughes, uh, they attend to our horses to make sure that they uh, are maintained in a healthy manner. They attend to all of the maintenance of the stables. Uh, the stable here at Monticello, of course, is on the, uh, on the southeast side of the house there where all of the, well, all of the, the drives, all of the roads come together from Shadwell and Mil Milton, of course, and the Secretary Road, ultimately. And uh, so they tend to the feeding of the horses, uh, the tacking of the horses, uh, bringing them around here to the carriage bays to be hitched. Uh, they teen, tend to the grooming of the horses. And I must say I'm rather particular about the, the grooming of the horses. Um, I am known, and I will not uh, disavow, uh, to take out my fine uh, handkerchief there and, uh, and rub it along, if you will, uh, the horse, uh, just from the withers on down along the side to, to the rump. And, uh, and if I find any dirt upon my handkerchief, well, Yes, it must be tended to again in its, in its proper grooming. Uh, the cleaning of the horses is necessary too. All of that attended to daily. Uh, we hope to keep our horses uh, healthy in kind. And furthermore, uh, with the feeding of the horses and, and all of the fodder that we provide there in the stables, uh, the building of the stable uh, must be of a particular maintenance. And by that, first and foremost, to have a good stone foundation rather than to ever allow the, the wood sills and otherwise to be seated on the ground or even uh, upon pillars that, uh, that lift the, the building up from the ground. No, no, a firm stone foundation. The reason? It prevents the rats. And rest assured, rats can do more damage to the maintenance of the horse, uh, uh, to infecting the horses with certain illnesses. Uh, than any other vermin that you might suffer, suffer in the proper stabling of your horses. So happily here at Monticello and at our farms, the stables have those secure stone foundations uh, for the proper stapling. Your next question. How are horses used as labor around your plantation? Horses are mostly used for labor about the plantation. Uh, at my threshing barn, it is the horses that are hitched to that threshing machine uh, to continue to follow one and the other around and around in a circle as that is want to thresh uh, at our wheat. The horses are used for our, our wagons here, for the hauling and the hostlers attending to that hauling, uh, which means, of course, not only wood, uh, most necessary to bring all about our farms, but uh, also manure that is necessary uh, for our gardens and for our fields. Uh, water, oftentimes, to be brought up from the Rivanna. And think of this, too, in the maintenance of the horses, that, that horses are wont to drink between 10 and 12 gallons a day. So we have to have that water necessary and on site. So many of our, our draft horses will bring, if you will, water up from the Rivanna. Uh, now, mind you, we do have oxen, of course, and we have mules. So a lot of the work done on our farms, on our plantations here, can be attended to by the oxen for the particular plowing, uh, and let alone by the mules uh, for hauling particular carts or, or wagons around. Next question. 
Mary would like to know if you ever use your horses for hunting. Hunting? Mary, I do beg your pardon. I mean no disrespect, but no, I have uh, never been favorable uh, towards hunting. Uh, I, I'll never forget when I was a young boy, my father asked me to go out and hunt a turkey. And I took the firelock out, and I just did not have the heart to, uh, to, to take a, a turkey. And as I was making my way back to the farmhouse, this is when we were living at Shadwell, well, I noticed there were several turkeys penned in a neighbor's uh, yard, and so I went over and took one of them. Didn't kill it, brought it back, but my father knew exactly what I had done. So, no, I, I, I am never a day out of the saddle. I, I have enjoyed horses all my life, hope to continue to, but uh, I have never used a horse for hunting. Christine would like to know how much does a horse cost? Mm. Well, the value of a horse is, um, well, it, it depends. It's, I wouldn't say a one set value on, on any one sort of a horse that can cost between $80 uh, for a small pony. Uh, I have spent as much as $200 uh, for a very fine hybrid uh, horse. So I would reckon within that particular uh, grade uh, of price that you can spend between $80 and, and $200 for a horse. Now, I, I almost lament and feel somewhat, uh, well, abashed to say this, but uh, a good working hand, one enslaved, is upwards of about $200 and $250. So that might help you understand the value uh, with respect to these purchases and acquisitions and um, the ownership of uh, the property thereof. I do beg your pardon in that reference. You mentioned earlier, uh, talking a little bit about horse racing. Horse racing, could you expand a little bit about your ideas on horse racing? Well, I think horse racing is frivolous. It's, it's throwing your money away. Uh, when I was brought up, my father discouraged that idea. And, and I, certainly, I certainly was in a particular society uh, that reveled in horse racing. Uh, I remember in Williamsburg, just across the James River, there were the racing fields in Surrey County, Virginia, and all society would enjoy to venture out to those racing fields uh, for an entire day or two to race their finest breed. Uh, that is, as I mentioned earlier, how the term quarter horse uh, began, how uh, your horse could make a particular distance quarter mile uh, within a time. And uh, yet, no, I've not been favorable for it. I know it continues, but it's a form of gaming and gambling, uh, which has never uh, received my interest and which I, I disapprove. Your next question. We have one last question. Do you think horses will ever become obsolete as a means of labor and transportation? That the horse? next to a dog, a man's best friend, should ever become obsolete or unnecessary? I hope not. Uh, to me, it's the greatest feeling of being akin with nature, with the rhythms of the universe. It is indeed, as I mentioned earlier, moments of great solace for me when I am on horseback, when I am in my phaeton or or my elegant Landau, which is somewhat a vis-a-vis -a -vis carriage where you can sit opposite one and the other and look. Uh, one never gets tired of the sounds, if you will, of the horse pulling you along through the woods and the forest, along the roads, let alone in the valleys up along the ridges, in the sides of mountains here, for instance. No, to me, horses and carriages, that transportation, uh, is a mark of civilization. Didn't, uh, didn't happen overnight. It took a long, long time. I know that when uh, the European first came here to the continent of North America, they discovered that uh, there were no horses for the most part. Oh, there may have been millennia ago. There are fossils that have been discovered that signify that. But we do believe it is the Spaniard that first brought uh, horses here. Uh, idea of, of riding horses and draft horses here uh, to North America. In fact, uh, 
I searched for a long time to find the, the volume of Cortez exploration and uh, finally acquired that of which I am most proud. Uh, never forgetting that these early European settlers were taking every moment to record the wonders uh, of this continent, uh, both flora and fauna, let alone the natives. And so there's a s signifying that horses brought by the Spaniards then were taken in kind by the natives and cultivated uh, over periods of time so that when finally the French and the Englishmen arrived here, they had already begun a, a culture in horses. And so we have continued that. A very elegantly made carriage, and I, I take some, um, well, credit, if you would allow, for designing my carriages. I mentioned the Landau. I also designed my, designed my Phaeton uh, right here. I think it is a mark of uh, artistic accomplishment for not only ease and comfort upon the roadways, but also a grace, if you will, of following in tandem with a horse. You can't get anywhere without that pull of the horse. Again, a four mile an hour world. I know of no place upon the globe where you can travel any faster than a ship at sea or a horse on land. I hope we never, ever lose that perspective. The reason, very simply, it allows us time to think. Well, better to enjoy the beauty of nature and to think than upon horseback or in an elegant carriage. Well, Ms. Wagner, I thank you very much for being our moderator uh, this week, and uh, I look forward to our further gatherings. Um, I had brought my saddle up here, uh, more or less, in order to, um, well, have it polished uh, here as we attend to polishing the seat in my phaeton. Um, but I'm going to bring it back now because uh, just the talk of horses is wanting to direct me back to the stables. So uh, I'm looking forward to greeting with you all later, and rest you assured, I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed. <laughs>